Hello, Gramophone fans. We are really excited this evening to be doing another Gramophone Live. We thank all of you for coming along. And I'm personally excited about this one because it's my first outside of the normal confines of Gramophone. We're actually up here in New Jersey today at Kef's Music Lounge, and we're here with the inimitable Ben Hagens. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Joe. Let's say hello, everybody uh, watching on the uh, on the other end of the uh, the internet. Um, you know, really pleased to have the guys from Gramophone here. It's been a great day, training, listening, experiencing. It's been a fun day for us all, and uh, hopefully, we'll share a bit of that with you guys today. It has been a ton of fun, and this music lounge is actually an amazing place. I don't know of any place like this, and I think that this is the only THX approved in wall. Uh, yeah, it's it's as far as we are aware. Yeah, it is the it is North America's only THX certified, kind of publicly accessible architectural home theater that also actually has dub stage certification as right. well. So, hugely accomplished home theater um, sounds fantastic. Yeah. So among the things we enjoyed today were we watched some movies that looked and sounded spectacular with no visible speakers, which is quite a feat to pull off. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you don't mind, please like and subscribe because the more subscribers we get, the better for us. Hit that notification bell so you always are aware of the new content that we're publishing. And please ask questions. There's a question drop down that will show up on the screen here. In fact, right now it says, welcome everybody and reminds everyone that if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. It's one of the beauties of doing this gramophone live kind of thing is we get to interact with you while we're going through a presentation. <clears throat> one more thing that I think is really important. I believe we have a giveaway, Mr. Ben. We do indeed. <laughs> so we have a pair of the LSX2s, yep. which is our small active loudspeaker system. So it's not actually a pair of speakers, it's a complete system. We'll talk about this a little bit later on in the uh, in the presentation. Uh, essentially, it's a complete system within two boxes. So it's you unbox them, obviously it comes as a pair, one power cable, one power cable, just add source and away you go. So you're able to stream basically anything you can probably think of. Um, also doubles as a wonderful soundbar replacement for HDMI input. Um, various other inputs as well. So a very, very, very much a Swiss army knife of a small contained all in one optimized system. Um, wonderful bit of kit, which we've been experiencing today with the guys at Gramophone and best of luck to you guys uh, in terms of the competition. In my experience, anything that's free, it's always about 2% better than the one that you actually had to pay for. Well, we had to ask the guys at Maidstone, our R&D department, about this, and they actually worked it out at 4.5%. Okay. You know, it, we, we're cutting fine there. Yeah. And the normal retail price of these is? So these are normally $1,400. Mm -hmm. So a great little system, um, everything in there, very high value. Right. As well. So even if you're a viewer who has a great system already, this is going to make a fabulous, you know, bedroom system or kitchen or den or whatever. And if you don't have a system as yet, then you really want to get these because it's an amazing sounding package. Uh, so thanks very much for that. And, you know, before we even get going, talking a little bit about Kef and then the specific products, I enjoyed hearing yesterday a little bit about you and your journey, how you wound up here at Kef. So if you don't mind just kind of introducing to the viewers yeah. just a little bit, you know, who's been and, and how you got yeah, here. So it has been a journey um, <laughs> that has almost circumnavigated the globe. So I got into the whole hi-fi industry um, as a musician. So I've, I've been playing multiple instruments since I was like five years old. Um, when I left university, which was for something completely different, um, I ended up actually signing a, a recording contract. We did a bit of touring, did a couple of albums. And uh, it's not a nine to five job. I mean, you ain't making money, you're, you're spending money, right? Um, so because I was already interested in the creation of music, the, the performance of music, the next logical step was the reproduction of music. And local hi-fi shop happened to have an opening and applied for that. Got that. Um, that lost. That lasted longer than the band did, um, as is the way of most things, right? 
Um, but the thing is, like, like one of the the brands that we that we carried was Kef, mm -hmm. and my my first ever proper pair of loudspeakers were, were Kefs. Um, so I, I kind of came out of hi-fi retail for a little while, um, but I was always kind of keeping tabs on what was going on and found a job advert for Kef, product training specialist, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I was obviously, you can probably tell from my accent, I was probably living in the UK at the time. Um, <laughs> and I, I saw Kef and said, okay, product training specialist, okay, I can talk about Kef. Then I saw Hong Kong, it was very much, mm, you know what, I'll put my CV in, right? <laughs> Nothing's gonna happen, it doesn't hurt anyone. A year later, I'm on the plane going over to Hong Kong. And so I spent my first five years with Kef, working out of Hong Kong, um, training, covering from Dubai to New Zealand, also started to become more involved in the product management side of things. So I'm also the product manager for the subwoofers now as well. Um, then sort of after the COVID years, um, I had the opportunity to come out here to Kef America and start training out of you know, this wonderful experience center, the Kef Music Lounge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in a snapshot that has kind of been my my journey. A pretty fascinating journey, if you ask me, from musician to seller of these products at retail to getting into product training, but in Hong Kong, no less, and then working your way back here. And, and now you're even doing project management for the subwoofers, which is a big responsibility. And for those in the audience who might not know much about Kef, I want to say that Kef is, when I started selling, which was in the early 80s, there were really three loudspeakers that were my aspirational loudspeakers, the ones I wanted to own. And one of them was the Kef, I believe at that time it would have been the 107, but it might have been the 104. But, you know, really, I think we need to talk a little bit about an interesting thing you said earlier today, that Kef has not only been around for a long time, but there's actually a heritage with Kef. Oh, absolutely. And... You know, in, in Kef's history, we've only had two owners. How, how many companies in this industry can claim that, especially since we've been around for 61 years? Mm -hmm. right? And that heritage, I, I talked earlier about um, how longevity and heritage is different. Heritage is about how long has your philosophy, your standards, your beliefs, your reason for being has gone through. And, and one of my favorite quotes from Raymond Cook, and I think it's up on the screen. Um, now, the extended quote is, of all art, music is the most indefinable, the most expressive, the most um, insubstantial, and the most immediate, the most transitory, and the most imperishable. Transformed to a dance of electrons down a wire, its ghost lives on. When Kef returns music to its rightful habituation, your ears and mind, we aim to do so in the most natural way we can, without drama, without exaggeration, without artifice. And that has rung true throughout these six decades of Kef. We, we're not interested in saying this is how something should sound. We are much more interested in going, this is, how some, this is what this sounded like. This is how it sounded. Um, we're creating tools that don't add a flavor to the sound. Uh, we're trying to forge a much more direct connection between artists and audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way to approach music. If the artist wanted to have more bass or less bass or more emotion or more whatever it is on the record, for a loudspeaker to reproduce it as is, I think that's a great way to go. We have just a couple audience comments. Mike commented, love that bright red blade. And you mentioned today that not only are there the standard colors if somebody wants to buy a pair of blade, but they can even get them in custom colors. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we do have a custom color program for the blades. Um, very exciting. You know, if, if you've got, say, if your favorite car or favorite car that you own, if you have, happen to have a fleet of them, um, <laughs> you know, if you've got a particular color that you want to kind of go for, we can work with the dealer, with, with the customer, and we'll try and get that matched Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can put at least a pair of blades in the garage next to the car or, or whatever. Um, you know, we, we actually have this wonderful um, paint and color team, which, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later. Yeah. Um, 
that are actually developing colors in between the Pantones to make sure that we can get perfect matches, not just, you know, if you've got a particular color you want to go mm -hmm. for, but even on our standard products, you know, if we're trying to match colors across different materials, you do need to touch into different actual paints and colors mm -hmm. to get that final match. So, yeah, very exciting addition to the blade. Yeah, offering. it's good. It's good. Uh, and David says uh, he sees life's treating you well since the good old uh, Superfly Lincoln days. So that's good. Yeah, that's uh, David McCaffrey, <laughs> who uh, who I worked under. Uh, he was my manager at Superfly for a little while. So uh, nice to see you, David. <laughs> and somebody from Gramophone wants to know if we can get a set in Gramophone yellow. I'm sure we can get that taken care of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So you wanted to say, actually, you have a few more remarks, I think, about Kef as a vendor, and then we'll start sw swinging into a little bit of the products themselves. Yeah. So um, ever since uh, ever since the beginning, Kef has very much been delving into engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, Raymond Cook, who was our founder, was an engineer by trade. So uh, he was in the Royal Navy. He worked for the BBC. He worked for Philips for, for a good while. Um, but also, as a child, he was a musician. He was a cellist. Mm -hmm. He used to play in a fair few kind of youth orchestras, etc. And when he came up through and, and he was looking at materials, mm -hmm. uh, how different materials work with loudspeakers, um, how can we manufacture a more consistent loudspeaker in terms of what comes off the production line. So... He was looking at paper, he was looking at silk, you know, very common materials, you know, in the 50s sure. um, for tweeters and, and drive units. But those are natural materials, and natural materials, by their very definition, are inconsistent. So how can the final product be consistent, right? So he found out about plastics, and that kind of kick-started the idea. He went to his boss at the time and said, oh, I want to try this, I want to try this, I want to try this. And his boss said, no. We're going to keep doing things the way that we've always done them. And Raymond did the logical thing and quit. <laughs> so he quit the company he was working for, uh, started Kef with a modest bank loan and two other individuals, and they rented a, you know, it, this is the cottage industry kind of story, right? right? They literally rented a shed on the site of a hops uh, machinery um, facility called Kent Engineering and Foundry down in Maidstone. And that's where KEF comes from, Kent Engineering and Foundry. So it came from that original site, which we're still at. Our R&D and our high-end manufacturing is still based on the same plot of land. Uh, new buildings, mm -hmm. but same plot of land. And mm -hmm. so all the R&D happens there, the high-end manufacturing. Um, so we still absolutely have our heart in Maidstone. Um, it's where all the history is, it's where, and the R&D department for KEF is such a special, special department. Um, it's not just the science of speakers that we're learning about, but the science of sound. And uh, the, 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 the engineers that come through, I mean, we even offer um, sort of internships and gap year, because there's two acoustics universities in the UK and they might come to work for us for a summer or for a year. If we like them, we might offer them a job at the end of it. And that's actually how our VP of technology, Dr. Jack Oakley Brown came into KEF. Mm -hmm. you know, he finished university, he'd done a little bit of work with KEF and hit the ground running, you know, just amassing patents left, right and center um, with his loudspeaker designs. Um, and it's not just acousticians that we have on, on the books. We have research physicists. We have a metamaterials expert. We have a DSP engineer, a very multifaceted mm -hmm. group of people. And they all come together to create these wonderful designs you know, from the very top to the very entry level. Uh, it's the same team that's working on everything top to bottom. And that gives us the consistency of sound through our products, which I believe is, has not been surpassed, mm. truly. 
You know, I would actually have a question for the audience members to think for a moment about the percentage, would you guess, of brands that you know who actually are able to do everything. In other words, the original concept for the product, the design of the product, the engineering of the product, ultimately then the building of the product, the testing of the product, what percentage of the brands that you know of have 100% of that under their own control? Because as you know, it's a pretty easy thing to do to say, okay, we need a speaker that's it's got a retail for this, it's the woofer should be this size, so forth. Hand that off essentially to somebody who is maybe many, many miles away and you get back the product. And the thing that you lose, I think, now it's not under your control. The quality is no longer something that you can really put your stamp on. Uh, so what, here's a, Chris uh, mentions, he'd guess about 5% of the companies do it. Not far off. V very good, Chris. Not far off. Uh, 2%. Yeah. 2%. It's a very, very small group that actually does uh, practically everything ourselves. I mean, we don't make the screws yeah. that we use to put the drivers into the cabinet. Um, but you know, the driver design and manufacture, the cabinets, the finishing, crossovers, you know, even going through to doing like the drop tests, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that you know, if the courier of choice accidentally knocks something off the, off the wagon, um, everything we're doing ourselves as far as we can do. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's how we can ensure that what leaves our factory is what the engineers have designed. But it also means that we are able to create a product experience from beginning to end. And this actually extends through to you know, the companies that we partner with in terms of, of being dealers and distributors. Mm -hmm. the, the pride of ownership of KEF is not only in the sound. Mm -hmm. It is in every single touch point from beginning to end. And being the level of manufacturer that we are is a huge part towards that massive part towards that right so and we would love to have by the way any and all of the uh, viewers out there now come to our showrooms because we're very recently involved with kef we had great support from john t who came down to our stores in timonium and columbia and gaithersburg maryland and helped set up the products in fact in our columbia store at least within the next few days i think we will actually have the blades on display so uh, quite a bit of product on display now at Gramophone, and we're extremely excited to have such a very famous and well-regarded brand and, and great-sounding brand that we can now present to the public. So this is, uh, has been great for us to get going with you guys. Looks like we have a question. Can we talk about a typical timeline to create a new driver for a speaker at KEF? Wow. Ooh. <laughs> How long's a piece of string? Um, <laughs> so... One thing that we will not do, mm -hmm. and this is hugely important for us, is we're not interested in change mm -hmm. for change's sake. So we will only bring out a new product if we feel that we've made a significant improvement over right. the previous. And LS50 is an amazing example for this because the original LS50 actually came out when I was in retail. This was back in... Um, so 20, 2010, 2011, right. it was the 50th anniversary. Right. Okay? And the LS50 was such this amazing little pot-bellied speaker, looked a little bit weird, had a weird combination of finishes, you know, the black cabinet with this rose gold uh, driver just right in the middle of it. And it was quite disruptive in many ways. Um, it took us eight years before we felt that we made a significant enough improvement. I mean, we could have made small improvements through the years, but that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. you know, our products, they have longevity in the market, they stick around. So you know that when you upgrade, it is going to be a significant improvement rather than a change. So it can take a few years in order to, to really get a, a driver to the next level. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit shorter, sometimes it's a, it's a little bit longer, um, but a lot of that is driven as well by what research we're doing outside of drivers specifically. Mm -hmm. So we're not just learning, say, the science of speakers, but the science of sound. 
So I think in a lot of ways, the answer to that question for Kef and a number of other high-end, high-quality brands that I know of is it takes as long as it takes yeah. to, for it to be, now we're proud of it. We really believe it's an upgrade. Now it's ready. Uh, and David has also put in a question about where Kef sees the traditional speaker market going. And specifically, is there possibilities for innovation in the AI industry, which I think all of us are asking at this point, where is AI really going to take us? And I don't know that anybody for sure knows that answer. But No, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's the AI question is not something that I've really thought about. Um, I've watched Terminator far too many times. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Skynet yeah. already. Um, but in, in terms of where traditional audio is going, I, I really do think there is still a lot of legs yes. in traditional audio. I mean, I think there's going to be a huge amount of growth in active. Yes. And active is going to start creeping up into the more mainstream higher end, shall mm -hmm. we say. Uh, that's where I really see it going. Um, but there is always going to be those people that they want to tinker, they want to change, they want to play. And I, I think we're always going to, going to cater for that in a big way, mm -hmm. in a big, big way. Um, it's where a lot of our business is still in passive. Mm -hmm. um, and if we didn't feel that it was something that was going to continue, then we wouldn't have continued doing things like blade and reference. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the higher end of the market, even in, in, if you're thinking about passive, a lot of our designs, a lot of our features, a lot of our uh, improvements start off at the top end. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got bigger research budget and more time so we can maybe work a few more things that may not have been possible otherwise. And because we have this same team that works through everything, right, the amount of either trickle down or adaptation that right. comes down. I mean, for example, Blade and LS60, which we have over here, is really indicative of this. Yes. Because we brought out Blade with its single apparent source configuration um, back in you know, sort of 20, 2010, 2011. And we always knew that we wanted to kind of take that idea and bring it into a more mainstream, maybe active speaker. Um, and we did. So this technology that we found in a $35,000 speaker has been adapted for a $7,000 active pair of floor standards. So yeah, having the courage to make a, a $35,000 pair of speakers, it's great on its own. And for those who can afford to take home a pair of these, it's fabulous. But then you get the benefits at $7,000, not all of them, but some, some very direct benefit there. So. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, uh, LS60, David uh, Daniel pointed out. Maybe we said LS50. I don't Did know. I? <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe you can tell us just a little bit then about some of the hallmarks that that you know there are certain things that tend to characterize a CAF speaker pretty much all up and down the line, whatever price point. Yeah. So the the obvious one will be UniQ. Mm -hmm. So UniQ is our signature technology. We first developed it back in 1988 uh, through the introduction of neodymium magnet material, which is 10 times more powerful than your standard magnets. So we were able to actually create a tweeter motor that was small enough that we could precisely align it with the acoustic center of the mid-range. Mm -hmm. So if you think of how all sound in nature is produced, right? everything comes from a single point. Sound comes from a point source. So you know, when we talk, for example, every single frequency we create comes from one point. So our, our belief was, and I think it's pretty well proven at this stage, is that the, one of the best ways to recreate sound is how, you, how it's created naturally. So UniQ acts as a point source. Uh, the other benefits of, of UniQ is the directivity, so the spread of sound of the tweeter and the mid-range is matched. So as long as you can see the mid-range, you can hear the tweeter. As you move off axis, the balance of sound doesn't change. It gets ever so slightly quieter as you move off. But the actual balance, the timbre, mm -hmm. um, now that's a question for the audience. Do you mm -hmm. pronounce it timbre, 
Tambra, Timber. Timber. Um, that's an argument I get in a lot with my colleague, Jack Sharkey. Um, so, yeah, we get this huge, huge sweet spot. And you, we often get asked, you know, how, you know, how much should I tow in UniQ? And the answer is start flat, just experiment with it. Mm -hmm. So having that same balance of sound going into the room, A, yes, you get big sweet spots, so you don't need to be smack bang in the middle with your head in a vice, a very clockwork orange, shall we say. Um, but it also helps work with the room mm -hmm. rather than necessarily against it. So one of the other big hallmarks with what UniQ does is this huge, expansive soundstage mm -hmm. and this pinpoint imaging. I mean, I played you guys a track on the blades earlier today, and that soundstage is almost coming almost like 70 to 80 degrees out mm -hmm. from the listening position. Just the way it envelops, the way that it immerses, it just seems right. Yeah, it's a huge benefit that if several people are sitting on the couch, they each of them gets a wonderful audio experience instead of that person dead on smack on center getting a wonderful experience and the people off to the sides not getting nearly as good of an experience. Yeah. And that's a benefit UniQ brings yeah. to every. Yeah, and, and, and I always say you know, music and, and film, it's seven billion different things to seven billion different people, mm. right? Mm. Um, why should only one person in a room get the best out of that right, and experience right. what they need to? Because yeah, listening to music, watch, and certainly watching film, yeah. right, is not necessarily something that you do by yourself. Right. So why should only one person get the best? The other side of that coin is not everybody wants to rearrange their living room around Correct. the speaker system. I know, surprise, surprise, <laughs> lots of people don't want to do that. Um, I mean, when I was living in Hong Kong, my last place was like 220 square foot. Yeah. Uh, so I was not going to be putting my speakers in the perfect right. place. Uh, they were just going where they fit. Uh, but thanks to UniQ, I was still getting a lot out of them mm -hmm. because of that UniQ driver array. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a hugely important. It's a way of allowing people to bring high quality music into their existing living situation. Right. We have a question from our listener, Chris, about with room correction software becoming more and more sophisticated. And of course, a lot of AVRs have room correction software built in. Is Kef looking into adapting or, or creating Kef's own room correcting software? Oh, <laughs> how to answer this. Um, so I, even though I'm the training guy, Right. I get very excited about things. So they don't tend to tell me until way down the process. It's okay to say to be determined. <laughs> that's an okay T V D. We'll say that. We'll say <laughs> yeah, that. That's, that's, that's totally okay. Um, yeah, say so I'll find out probably when you guys do <laughs> if that happens. So your your slide had a, a few more of the specific things that Kef tends to do over and over and over again. Yeah. So um, more recently, um, we actually started to apply meta materials mm -hmm. to loudspeakers. And this is a really exciting bit of science in general. Um, and it was never designed for audio. You know, we're very good at looking at things and saying, oh, that looks good. Let's see how we can make that, adapt that for audio. So meta materials, I mean, first off, let's break it down. Meta is Greek for beyond. Materials is English for materials. Uh, so meta materials beyond materials. So if I wanted to make a table, right, I would have a, a list of materials that I could choose from, and they have their own benefits and drawbacks. I'm not necessarily choosing the best material, probably more the least worst. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with a meta material, it's the other way around. What you do is you start with what you want to achieve, mm -hmm. and then you take an existing material and give it a new structure in order to achieve that benefit. So mm -hmm. through meta materials, you can actually achieve things that ha you can't achieve in nature. So we found out about a company called the Acoustic Meta Materials Group out in Hong Kong. And what they were dealing with was um, ventilation noise. Tremendous noise. Lots of noise. And the only way to truly cut the noise is by blocking the vents. But if you block the vents, Everybody it's no longer high. a HVAC system, yeah. right? So what they did was they developed a meta material that actually lines 
the sides of the duct. And they have this really good video on their website showing this. They have like a little experiment. Um, so what this material does is as sound travels through the duct, the sound gets absorbed from the side. This does not exist in nature. So we found out about this. And so, oh, that's pretty cool. How can we adapt this for loudspeaker design? And the first thing that we tackled was the back wave of the tweeter. So a driver, as you'll all be aware, moves backwards and forwards. So it sends just as much sound backwards as it does forwards. And what happens with the back wave is that it bounces around inside the box. Some of it goes back into the tweeter and causes it to distort. Adding distortion. Yeah. And distortion, we have no interest in playing no. with. We don't want distortion. So with this metamaterial, it's basically um, a disc with 30 channels coming off of the central sort of main channel. And they're all different lengths. Yep. And the idea here is... And you can see each, those in the slide, actually. Yeah. If we can pop the slide up again, um, you, you can actually see the channels and the way that they're sort of woven yeah. together. So the, uh, the image on the second from the left. So each channel has a, has a, a different length, mm -hmm. so it resonates at different frequencies. Mm -hmm. So once you combine all those together, that back wave goes into this disc and it starts to excite various... <clears throat> channels which are which then absorb cancel out the, those frequencies in that back wave so we're actually absorbing about 99 percent of all the frequencies above 620 hertz coming from the back of that tweeter and in a meta speaker you can really hear that clarity on the high end and in my experience all consumers you know whether it's country classical rock and roll whatever all consumers love a clear, clean, high end. And I, I, I remember the first time I listened to the original LS50 <laughs> versus the LS50 Meta. And I was playing um, uh, Gas Station Rose by Sean Rowe. And he's got this beautiful baritone voice, beautiful baritone voice. And on the original LS50s, you know, his voice was sounding thick, it was sounding tough, it was, it was great. The LS50 Metas showed me why his voice was sounding like that on the originals. And you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with how this track was recorded. And he was recording the vocals in a small, small high ceiling chamber. So there was a lot of very quick, natural reverb yep. in the room. With the distortion that was caused by that back wave coming back into the tweeter, it was starting to blend like the foundation of his voice with the early reverb. Mm -hmm. So it was artificially thickening up uh -huh. his voice. With the meta material applied, that just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So you're given a much clearer window into how, I mean, I've always said this about hi-fi, listening to good hi-fi is not about listening to a recording. Mm -hmm. It's about experiencing the performance. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I was getting through that. Mm -hmm. um, I brought a few colleagues in and you get the stereotypical questions. Are you sure you're playing the same mix, mm -hmm. et cetera? Uh, because it was that night and day. Um, it just works. Yeah. That's, that's all I can say about it. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, let's, you, you were right, Daniel, to ask your question about don't the active KEF speakers actually have room and desk and wall type EQ settings? And the answer is yes. I think our, our previous, and when Chris asked the question, he was asking more, are we planning on bringing a more full bore EQ scheme into it? But yes, yeah, some some EQ is actually already a part of the product line. Yeah, so, so we're probably going to delve onto that later, but yeah. we may as well broach it. Yeah, now. sure. So as I mentioned earlier, people aren't necessarily going to be putting the speakers in the, the perfect positions, mm -hmm. right? So within the app for the LSX2s, the LS50 Wireless 2s, and the LS60s, you can tell them a little bit about how you've placed them in the room. So on the LSX2s and the LS50s, you can tell them if they're on a stand or if they're on a desk or yep. a shelf. Yep. If they're on a shelf or a desk, how far from the front edge is the speaker sitting? And it will very subtly but very powerfully adjust the EQ based on that. Uh, distance from the wall behind, the size of the room, um, quite a few, simple but powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't need to have a, a degree in acoustics in order to get the best out of a product. Right, right. right. 
Um, so, and the beautiful thing is you, you can actually do all of this once music is playing. So you can hear the changes. And if you don't agree with, you know, say if it's 50 centimeters and you put 50 centimeters and you go, actually, I think 40 centimeters sounds better. Then that's right. Then that's right. Do it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So trust your ears. <laughs> Very good. Um, What's the best to choose with a specific Marantz, the PM 7000N? But I think in a small room, really what you just talked about a moment ago is you always want to try it because even if you know that it's a large room versus a small room, is it a room that's furnished in a very spare way? Is it stuffed with heavy furniture and carpeting that's going to absorb? I think the right answer to any EQ scheme is try it both ways or all three ways in this case, and see how it sounds. And when it sounds right to your ears, then leave it there. Yeah, I, mean, I think this, this guy's talking more about equipment. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty electronics agnostic. Um, yeah. You know, and we pride ourselves on that mm -hmm. in, a, in a very big way. So when it comes to equipment, it's demo it. Seriously, go into your local brick and mortar. Yep. Um, you know, if they uh, if they offer home demo, great. If not, they're fully experienced. Um, everybody has different ears. Everyone has different tastes. Yeah, and I see you're you're right. You're correct that this question really is more about which pair of kefs would be right for that particular receiver. That's I think the beauty of Gramophone is that we have both three different stores, all located you know far enough from each other that it makes it easy for almost anybody in Maryland to come and audition. But we have live auditioning in those stores and we have our online sales and the two support each other. Uh, so we urge you, if you can, to come on down to, you know, either Timonium or Columbia or Gaithersburg, Maryland and, and check it out. Take a yeah. listen. Hugely experienced yeah. team. Um, you, you wanted to talk a little bit about driver technology, I know. Yeah, so what, what, what am I, uh, being the subwoofer product manager, um, <laughs> you know, I want to talk a little bit about our, well, it, actually, we have it sitting up here, yeah. our Unicore yep. driver. So Unicore um, first came out with the, um, the KC62, the little compact subwoofer, which is, oh, that kicks out for like, it's, it's not incredible even, for its, it's size. It's not even a good subwoofer for the size. Mm -hmm. It's a good subwoofer. Period. Um, yeah, it's just a wonderful little box of tricks. And I mean, as I've been saying a lot through today, sort of paraphrasing um, what's called a um, spinal tap, mm -hmm. you know, goes down to 11 yeah. um, rather than goes up to 11. Um, so the Unicore, interestingly, actually was developed for the LS60 because mm -hmm. with the single apparent source mm -hmm. technology, it works right. better when the drivers are much more closely packed together. That's right. So now we have this slim unit, and the, the prototype for this was in like 2014 or so. So most of the things were going well with it. It's just the base wasn't quite what it needed to be. So that's what actually kick-started the R&D process to develop Unicore. So for those of you that don't know, the Unicore driver, it's a force cancelling arrangement. So we have two cones back-to-back -back right. this way. playing in phase, so they're doing this. But in order to help save space, what we did was we actually built the two drivers into a single motor system. Mm -hmm. Now, if we didn't do anything else, you know, we would lose excursion because the, the voice cores could only go so far before they bang into each other. So we made one voice coil bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. So what they actually do is they slide over each other maximizing excursion so that gives us more output more extension um there was a lot more we had to put into it in order to get it to work um the unicore itself is just to save space mm -hmm. but through the design of the motor system through the voice coil design um even things like so one voice coil being larger there's more mass mm -hmm. so to get force cancelling to work properly we need the two drivers to work identically, okay? <clears throat> so with the additional mass over here, we had to add some extra mass to the second driver to balance it out. Mm -hmm. And there's some other things like force factor we had to look at because larger voice coil, larger gap, less flux, density. 
the other one smaller coil but higher flux density so it was trying to work out like two times six and three times four yeah to try and get a, the same final response um we developed a whole new surround for the unicore so normally with a small box you know, the drivers are moving in at high excursion the air inside is going to try and fight against the driver it's the only place where the air can go right in a, in a sealed um, cabinet so what normally would happen is you would put a big chunky roll surround on the, on the outside of the driver which is very good at resisting that internal pressure but it's heavy you're gonna yeah. low sensitivity so we actually use a concertina or like accordion shaped surround so the strength is in the shape so it allows us to keep the material the mass low so we continue having that excursion but still resisting the uh the the, the air inside the box and, and what i find so brilliant about this concept essentially two drivers put into one is that it now means that the subwoofer cabinet which in a subwoofer typically the cabinet is actually resonating a lot and that's going to add distortion and just detract from the sound but with these two operating essentially in concert with each other it means that the cabinet doesn't move at all so a big part of why as, as you said it's not just a great subwoofer for its size but it's a great subwoofer is the box vibration is virtually eliminated yeah, and that, that's a force cancelling is a concept that we actually commercialized mm -hmm. back in 1984. Okay. And I think one, one, so we have it on the KF92, which is like the bigger brother mm -hmm. of the KC62. We have it on the blades mm -hmm. as well. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite demos to do with the blades, and this is not musical, we actually, and I can see it from here on the other blade, um, we yeah. actually balance a, a nickel yeah. on its end on yeah. the top of the speaker. And, you know, we might play something like Massive Attack or some, um, some Dead Mouse or so. We were playing loud today. And that coin does not move. No. Uh, if you don't mind me jumping in just with a couple quick questions. One is what's the best KEF frequency response in wireless mode? Are there any hotter frequencies noted in a reflective environment? Uh, that's David's question. Okay. So... With the amount of, so we did a, a lot of research into distances, frequencies, how that relates mm -hmm. uh, in terms of different materials, in mm -hmm. terms of different um, room sizes, room shapes, positions. So without getting into the weeds of like a parametric EQ, uh, we found that doing kind of small, subtle, maybe like shelving filters and notch filters, um, that's how we work in the KEF app. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very much a way of us to try and help to alleviate those additionals or generally in, in more reflective rooms or dead rooms. Mm -hmm. So in reflective rooms, we're starting to tame down the top end. In um, more dead rooms, you want to kind of boost it up a little bit mm -hmm. more. It is relatively subtle, but with the amount of steps that we have, I think we're going down to like 0.5 dB steps. Okay. So you've got a fair bit of tunability there. Um, okay. Very good. And uh, also that one pretty good. A question about when it comes to the uh, R11 Meta, which Unicore sub might work the best, the, the KC62 or the KF92? Okay. So first thing, just to quickly address in that yeah. question, the KF92 is not Unicore. Unicore is an exercise in reducing the size yeah. of the box. The KF92, the box is big enough that we can use two discrete drivers sort of braced back to back to get the force cancelling. Um, Unicore, as I, say, I have spoken to the R&D team on this, Unicore <clears throat> doesn't really sort of translate into a larger box. You don't get any more benefit because we've got more air behind we can have separate drivers so we can maximize yeah. the, the excursion. But with the two drivers in the 92, you still get the main benefit of force canceling that the box yeah. isn't moving yeah. and, and adding distortion. So Now, the key thing on, for the second part of the question is that the, the actual performance of the KC62 and the KF92 are extremely similar. Mm -hmm. But there's always a but. 
So the KF92 does the same, but has more output. Mm -hmm. So just off the top of my head, I think the, the KC62 has a max SPL of uh, 105 dB, mm -hmm. whilst the KF92 has a max SPL of 110. Mm -hmm. So that's nearly double output. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's really up to you know, your situation, uh, your room, if you want to go for one or two subs, I, I think I've proven to you guys that I'm Absolutely. a big proponent of multiple subs. De definitely, um, me too. And so it, it, it's really down to, to what your expectations are. Yeah. Um, I mean, KC62 in this room, and this is a pretty big room. I mean, one like, over there, I think that's like 30, 35 foot mm -hmm. or so. It's, it's a large room, and, and KC62 does not embarrass itself in any way, shape, or mm -hmm. form in this room. Um, and it's not an acoustically treated room, this room either. It's, it's a very realistic room. Right. Um, but it's getting up to the ceiling of what it can do. Yep. Where KF92 has that little bit more headroom. Um, so it's pop into gramophone, have a try. Yep. Go between them, um, see what you think. That's, that's, that's probably the best way of doing it. When I worked for a subwoofer manufacturer for seven years, we referred to a larger box as free output. Free yeah. volume, yeah. yeah. Uh, a question about would we recommend a Mac MC275 to drive a pair of LS50 Meta? I think that would sound fantastic. Uh, we are a Macintosh dealer at Gramophone, and you know, yeah, again, I would urge you either to you know, stop into one of our stores or, or uh, you know, pop onto our website Either way, uh, apparently some David thinks you sound a lot like Andrew Jones, but with a deeper voice. You do certainly both have British accents. Well, he's he's Welsh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> so uh, if, if if you cannot tell the difference between the Welsh and the uh, and another English accent, um, maybe get the ears syringed. It's maybe the, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, actually, Andrew actually used to work for Kef. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's back right, in right. back in the back right. in the eighties. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so it looks like for now we've kind of popped through our questions and, and maybe we can kind of get to the next topic that you yeah. had suggested. Yeah. So one, one thing that I feel that we need to talk more about as, mm -hmm. as a company is our design. Yeah. You know, I mean, speakers, you know, as an audiophile, I should never say you know, I care about the looks. But let's be fair. Loudspeakers take up real estate in the home. You know, and as mentioned earlier, the pride of ownership in KEF should be in every single touch point. Yeah. So we do spend a <clears> lot of time, effort, and work in the industrial design of our products. Now, if there is a decision to be made and the outcomes, one is better acoustics or one is better visuals, better acoustics always wins. Without a doubt, always wins we will force the aesthetics to work for the acoustics. It's hugely important to us. We have this wonderful internal product planning and design team. Um, they are, they've been around acoustics and design for a long, 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 long time. So they work really closely with our R&D team. Um, but sometimes for special products, we go out and we work with external designers. So one of the more famous ones is with the Muon, um, sort of our ultimate, you know, nearly quarter of a million dollar pair of speakers, which was um, designed in conjunction with Ross Lovegrove, who does this does wonderful work in aluminium. And I, that is aluminium, by the way, we're a British brand. So, <laughs> um, so I, I refuse to say aluminium. Um, and I mean, that was a wonderful project. You know, and, and so the more he learned about acoustics and the more that we learned about design, the way it just kind of came together. And you know, j just as this monolithic speaker that actually blends into the room, because right. it's, it's raw aluminium, the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So it reflects everything visual. Um, it's a super formed aluminium. So it's built in a very similar way to aluminium body sports cars. Mm -hmm. um, but sports cars would have the panels riveted together because if you start to weld aluminium because the low melting point it starts to buckle we actually do weld the front and the back halves together it's not the easy thing to do but it's the right thing to do and then they go through i think it's 160 hours of polishing 
Mm -hmm. So you do not see the scene. It's very clear to me as I look at a variety of Kef products that your team, and it is a team of people designing the products, take design very seriously because, I mean, take the blade, for example. There are many, many speakers in a twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar price range that it almost doesn't matter how great they sound; they're not going home with you because the physical appearance is so not domestically friendly. They're not going home. So I look at a product like a Blade, and I think, boy, they did a great job not just making this sound fantastic, but it looks really attractive. Yeah, the, it's a design product. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the curvature of Blade is. It is 100% based in an acoustic principle. Uh, so if you've got sharp edges on a cabinet, that causes diffraction. Mm -hmm. And diffraction is delayed sound, it's additional sound, mm -hmm. sound that we do not want. Yeah. So that curvature is basically, so it's lots of little corners, pushes up the frequency that it hits in much, much higher. Right. Um, so it all started from an acoustic design principle. Mm -hmm. And then it's how do we put it into a package that also looks fantastic. Right. Um, but it also kind of slightly dovetails into what I was saying earlier about trickle down. Mm -hmm. So, for example, right. Our, right. our reference range in the LS and the LS50. So the LSX and the LS50 have this curved front baffle, which is to try and achieve not exactly what that's doing, but Very close. a good proportion of it. Mm -hmm. Same with the reference and the R series, which are more rectilinear boxes. They do have sharp edges, but the shadow flare that sits around the UniQ, the idea is that it stops the tweeter from having a line of sight to the edges of the cabinet. So tackling a sim the same thing, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. we're not always going to get like the <clears throat> curvature technology into other products, but we will find different ways to, uh, to try and get the same outcome. Whenever possible. Uh, quickly, we can answer, I think, David's question. Are there resonance issues with two different size voice coils? And the answer is no, that your engineers actually spent a lot of time making sure that those two voice coils in one product were not interfering with each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, that, that, was, uh, that was the big, big part of that. And like the linearity between those two drivers okay. is so well matched. Okay. Um, I, I would recommend if you're interested in delving into the real nitty gritty, into the uh, the Unicore, um, have a okay. check on the KC62 white paper. Yeah, that's uh, what it's, I was all, it's say. a great read. Uh, how do I enter the speaker giveaway? There is a QR code that we've got popped up, but I believe that there's also a link that uh, if it's not on the screen at this point, will pop up. Uh, near the end of our program, which is somebody's already scanned the, the QR code, so I know that that's been up. There's also a link that uh, has the giveaway details. Uh, so we'll, we'll pop that all up very soon. We're about maybe five, 10 minutes or so away from, from wrapping up our Grand oh, wow. Live. So <laughs> it, I know quick. It's, it's gone quickly, but um, <laughs> maybe there are, I know some other things that you want to touch on in terms of KEF you know, design and manufacture and, and uh, some of the other yeah, things. So that I, I, I think with, with the... With the time we have left and the fact sure. that we have the LSX2 as a, as a giveaway, yeah. um, I'd like to give a little bit more insight into the active products. I mean, we talked a bit about Blade. We talked a bit about single apparent source. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the active. So as I mentioned at the top of the, of the show, yeah. the LSX2s, the LS50 wireless 2s, the LS60 wireless, they are not speakers. They are complete systems in the two boxes. Add source Just and Just add source and power, right? Um, so inside each box, so just pass over the, the, the LSX2 yeah, sure. for me. Absolutely. So, so for those of you that may not have caught earlier, so UniQ has separate tweeter, mm -hmm. and we have the separate mid-range around it. So in both boxes of the pair, we have one amplifier for the tweeter, which on the LSX2 is a 30-watt Class D amplifier. Mm -hmm. We have a 70-watt Class D for the mid-range, and that's in both boxes. So we've got four amplifiers in total. Each of them has their own DAC, so we don't get crosstalk. Mm -hmm. We keep the signal digital all the way up to the very end. So that's what allows us to introduce the DSP, so our music integrity engine, which is our in-house designed, in-house coded DSP engine. And the reason that's important is because normally DSP is like drag and drop off a shelf 
kind of thing. But because we designed the drivers, we designed the cabinet, we designed the amplification, we're in the best possible position to stitch those bits together to bring the sum of the parts, the, the final effect even higher through the DSP, just stitching together just that little bit, little bit more. Um, it also allows us to have wireless inter-speaker connection mm -hmm. between the two speakers. And the demos I've been doing with the gramophone guys, though, all the active products, they have all actually been without the tether in between, between the speakers. Yes. Um, works wonderfully, wonderfully well. Um, now, the only difference is when you do wired inter-speaker connection, everything gets resampled to a higher uh, bit rate and bit depth, the sampling rate and bit depth, sorry. Um, but there's many situations in which a person, just for aesthetic reasons, cannot cable oh, yeah. the two of them, and they work great. We heard today without. I, I really want to reinforce what you're saying, too, is that the only way to really get the maximum from DSP is if everything in the system is under your control, which, again, in this case, because you do all the manufacture as well, it is all your, under your control. Yeah. I mean, the, the word I used a lot in the beginning when I was training uh, dealers about the active products was optimization. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're optimizing every single part of the chain here. Mm -hmm. um, but some people might want something slightly different. So you know, that's where the EQ can come in. Um, we also have a, an analog input on all of them. Now, that, it does get digitized. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we can't do the DSP. And Correct. The, but if somebody were to want to add a little bit of extra flavor or a different flavor, I should say, you could always run a DAC of your choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're adding an extra A to D and D to C, uh, A to D in there, which isn't actually that much of an issue. Uh, right. I think a lot of people make a lot more of it than it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do that. Um, in terms of connectivity on these, oh God, it's like if you can, if you have it, you can probably connect it. <laughs> I mean, on the wireless aspect, you know, they are AirPlay Two, they are Spotify Connect, they have Chromecast, uh, they are Rune ready, mm -hmm. straight out the box. Obviously, we've got Bluetooth uh, native in the uh, Tidal Connect as well. Mm -hmm. Native in the Kef Connect app, we can get Cobuzz, Deezer, Amazon Music, um, Internet Radio, podcasts. Just a huge amount of, of music, basically anything in the world that you could want to, to grab onto. And I can take my phono preamp if I want and plug it into the yeah, analog. Yeah, and go into the analog, yeah. Now Absolutely. you've got turntable as well as all yeah. the digital I sources. say you're blending the old technology with the new. That's right, right that's right. Um, let's say all of them also have HDMI CEC on board. Um, and basically turning them not just this wonderful music system but also into a wonderful soundbar mm -hmm. replacement yep. and because it's two separate boxes get them slightly spread apart you get imaging imaging uh, yep and if you look at the size of the drivers i mean they're putting out bass they're putting out cohesive integrated sound i don't think you can have a better soundbar than these yeah absolutely daniel asked are they a rune endpoint and the answer is absolutely yes daniel <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, it, it appears that we've pretty much covered uh, all of the questions that people have asked. I mean, you may have some final thoughts that you want to introduce about Kef and, and so forth. And I have a couple comments I wanted to make about how excited we are. So, Yeah. That's, well, first off, again, we've been very excited to have the Gramophone guys here today. Um, very new to us. Um, you know, we are very picky with who we work with. And because you know, again, it comes back to those touch points. Yes. You know, the people that we work with, we want the touch point with them to be just as good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are very, very, I like to think we're a relatively friendly bunch. Um, and we, tr we treat anything with our dealers as, as a partnership. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is, right? Um, in terms of demoing Kef as a pop down. To the guys, I've still not, I've not gone down yet, but I'm very excited to hopefully go down in the near future. We look forward to it. Um, I need to explore a bit more of the states as it is, um, but no, really looking forward. You know, have, having spent you know, today with these guys, um, really thrilled. Yeah, to, to have you guys on board with us. Well, and part of why we're personally excited, I think, 
we're we're delighted to have Kef in our stores and and able to be purchased from uh, Sky by Gramophone for at least many of the products, not quite all of them. But I think personally, as I look at the future, I think one of the hallmarks of what's going to happen going forward is yes, there will be traditional loudspeakers. Those are not going to go away. But because of the things you were talking about a few moments ago, when you really have it all under your control, when you're doing all the design and manufacture as KEF is, but you've also got the amplification, the DSP, writing the DSP the way you want it to get the most out of the specific cabinet and driver and amplifier and everything else in the package that you've engineered. To me, that's really what makes a product like this enable to sound so good in such a tiny package. I, it was many years ago that I realized I was looking at some gigantic speaker in our industry that sounded phenomenal. But I realized how much of an engineering achievement is it really to take this gigantic box and make that sound good when you've got so much free amplification, this sort of thing. And if you look at an LS60, for example, as you say, a direct descendant of a blade at, at a, a less than a quarter of the price, you know, that to me is really an exciting area where a loudspeaker and system design is going. And I think that makes me personally excited that we've got Kef on board because you look to the future and, and think, man, this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think together it, it's, it's never been easier to have anybody, whether uh, we, we're bringing that entry into high performance, yep. even lower, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that bar, uh, because everybody deserves great sound. Yep. And through Kef, through our products, through our partners, um, more and more people are hopefully going to be able to listen and believe. Yep. Well, so let's make sure we remember to say thank you to all of the Gramophone supporters out there who have purchased from Gramophone over the years. Our company is not quite as, as old and been around quite as long as Kef, but not too, not too recently after Kef was, was founded because we're celebrating our 50th anniversary very soon here. So thanks to all of you guys, number one, number two, for more information, of course, about KEF, please visit our website and about all the rest of our wonderful products. Uh, buy something to amplify these products with at gramophone.com. There's a wealth of resources there. Thank you for supporting our YouTube channel, of course, Gramophone MD. We want to invite all of you to also shop online with us at Sky by Gramophone. The, uh, my understanding is that the KEF products are not quite up on Sky by Gramophone just yet, but will be pretty soon, at least many of the KEF products, not all of them. So there's all of that. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd be so kind if you enjoyed this time. Please do leave a comment for us. We'll try to get back to you as, as promptly as we can because, of course, uh, this will post very shortly here, Ben. It'll post very shortly after we, we wrap up tonight's, uh, tonight's presentation. So thank you for joining us. And let's make sure that uh, we reiterate the giveaway opportunity to win not just a pair of speakers, but a complete system once you, know. you add your source in. Uh, and in these LSX2s, somebody's going to be very lucky. So you can, I think we see on the screen now that the LX2 wireless giveaway is actually up on the screen. So we've both got the QR code. And then there's also the link that you can use. The winner will be announced, I think, at the end of the month. So there is some time after this evening, but you might as well do it now while you're, while you're watching. So uh, thanks to all of you out there in gramophone land, especially thanks to Kef. Ben, we're excited to be partners with you, and we look forward to seeing you and all of our viewers in our stores someday soon. Thanks very much.